Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited for today's interview. We are talking fantasy, we are talking magic, we are talking myths, we are talking legends, and we are talking everything that's witchy and in between. We have thousands of well-loved ratings and reviews and have been on so many lists. I'm so excited. We are talking to the one and only TJ. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. Now, I realise I should say we are talking to the one and only TJ Green. I feel so casual already, like we're best friends. Like, this is a <laughs> day. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine with that. Take me back to the start. Why did you start writing and how was your publishing journey? I guess, like a lot of writers, I started a very long time ago. When I was a child, I just kind of liked to kind of like scribble little stories. And then um, when I was studying English at school, I really loved the creative writing. And probably since I've been about 10 or 11, I've kept diaries like regularly for years. Um, and then I guess I wanted to make it um, more serious. Probably when I moved out to New Zealand, actually it was my intention that I wanted to do uh, an English degree and a lot of the papers um, as part of that were um, the expressive arts. There was a lot of creative writing. And that's what really kicked me off into kind of writing properly. Yeah. So how then did your first story come about? How did you find writing your first book? It was really hard <laughs> and it took forever. You probably know when you do creative writing courses, they're all short stories. And I I wanted to write something longer, but I set a challenge to myself to write a once upon a time story. And out of that came um, my first Arthurian book, which is now called Call of the King, but at the time was called Tom's Inheritance. And I wrote the short story, which turned into the prologue of it. And I kind of finished the short story and thought, well, what happens kind of now? Where does Tom's granddad go? What happens to him? What does Tom do when he follows him? So it kind of came out of that. But I was working full time, I was studying for my English degree, and the story just kind of fitted around there. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing. So I muddled through and it took me five years, basically. And obviously, uh, you know, I did what I guess a lot of people do as well, kind of pitched it around a few publishing houses before I realised it would take forever. Um, and I was learning about self-publishing. So I decided to go the self-publishing route. When you left, and I feel like I should mention, English born, yes. now I've been living in New Zealand for 14 years, so we have a, yeah. an amazing accent. What, um, you obviously had the intention when you left the UK, I want to write a book. Yeah. Did it go how you thought it would go in any way or capacity? Um, no, no. And I guess... I didn't even think of it in terms of I'm going to write and publish. It was just I would just really want to explore writing. So the fact that I ended up kind of self-publishing, um, yeah, I didn't even really see that on the cards, if I'm honest, at all. So how did you find it then, self-publishing? Liberating, actually. I'm really glad I decided to do it because I actually quite like having control over uh, my covers and um yeah, who, who I edit and what I want in my books and I don't want people telling me how to write my books as such. Um, but yet it was hard. There's no doubt about it. There's so much to learn. So the first thing I did when I decided I wanted to do was I needed, I did a lot of reading around it and I knew I needed a professional cover and I knew I needed um, a professional editor. Yeah. So I kind of just started that. So it was a good probably 12 months before I even pressed publish on it and I really needed that time to get it right and what year was that that you published it was 2016 16 yeah. amazing. Five years ago when did you leave the full-time job I left it about 12 months ago actually really congratulations yes. thank you yeah so that was awesome yeah, what a journey. And I'm assuming as well you do, since then, you've probably learned a lot yourself about like marketing and realising that there's more than just hitting publish, obviously, and you've written a whole pile of books since then as well, quite the journey, and now you're a full-time author. Yeah, so it's um, it was a very slow start because, as I say, um, my first book took ages to write, and then um, the second one took 
just under a year because by then I kind of got a feel for it and I'd gone through the editing process. Um, and then I did the third one, but that was like one book a year and they weren't selling that well. And I thought, well, I really want to make this work yeah. by that, point, which is when I started the Witches series. And that's when I really kind of get started to think seriously about it in terms of really learning how to market and um, write something that would appeal to a bigger audience. Yeah. So I've learned, I knew nothing when I started, absolutely nothing. And uh, I probably still don't know as much as I should, but I know a lot more. <laughs> would you say that much of your study in English really helped you down this path of self-publishing as well? No, not not at all. They certainly don't talk about self-publishing when you do English degrees. It's all about traditional publishing. Mm. So no, not at all. So all of that was kind of self-taught. And then I enrolled in like some courses, um, the Nick Stevenson's Your 10,000 Readers, and I enrolled in self-publishing formulas, you know, Amazon ads for authors, as well as numerous other kind of bits and pieces that you kind of read. Um, so no, they never talked about that during the English degree. Speaking of witches, I want to talk a little bit about one of your very well-loved series. So Buried, uh, Buried Magic is the first book in this series. Yeah. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah. So um, as I say, I kind of just published the third in my Tom series, um, The King. And I thought, um, I thought, no, I really want to try something more contemporary. Um, and I was thinking about urban fantasy because I do quite enjoy the paranormal and mysteries and myths and legends. Um, and the, I guess the thing I really enjoyed writing about in Rise of the King was the witches from the, the King Arthur tales. So Morgan Le Fay and um, the Lady of the Lake. And I thought I really want to have the focus of my stories about witches. And I wanted to be, I wanted them to be the heroes and not the bad guys. Yeah. And um, as part of my English degree, actually, I had done a paper on witchcraft and magic, which was absolutely fascinating. So I've always been interested in witches and witchcraft. Yeah. Um, so I basically decided um, that I wanted the, the basis of my story to be based in real magic um, and real witchcraft. So I wanted it to feel really grounded. So that's kind of where that story came out of. So obviously, like a lot of urban fantasy, it's set in the real world, but the paranormal world sits underneath it. But it was really important to me that the magic was quite real. And how much research did you have to do for that? Quite a well, I say quite a lot. I was because I'm quite interested in it anyway. It was um, I knew kind of quite a lot of it, kind of history of it. Um, but yes, I certainly bought a few more books about kind of Wiccan uh, witchcraft and and witchcraft in general, and just looked at rituals and the Sabbaths, you know, like the solstice and the equinoxes and the celebrations around those. And it just kind of grew from there. But how long did this book take you to write? Um, not long at all, really, once I first started. I, so by about June, I think, of 2008, that's when I decided, OK, I'm going to really think seriously about this. And, um, you know, uh, the Facebook groups, 20 books to 50K readers. Yeah, so I was so inspired by so many of the stories on there. Um, so I kind of really decided to approach it more as business and to write more regularly and dedicate my time after work to it. So it probably took me about three to four, three months. That's amazing. So, yeah. And it kind of started to really flow, to be quite honest. It was just kind of flowed off the page. So I really did quite a lot of work just before I started just thinking about the characters and who I want to be in it and where it would be set and what the name of it was. I really wanted to na the name to reflect the stories and uh, the place, uh, which of course is set in Cornwall. So, yeah, so, um, but once I started, yeah, about three months. 
Did you do anything special for this launch? Because at this um, point you decided, right, let's go all in, we're going to make this work. Did you do anything different with that release and going forward for the series? How was it received? I I didn't do anything too major other than obviously share it on my Facebook page and talk to my, I have a newsletter list, you know, so I talked to my subscribers about it. Um, uh, It was more that I really wanted to make the the titles right and the, the series title right. So it really fitted the genre. So I wasn't exactly writing complete, I guess. Yeah, I was writing to a genre, but my own spin on it. Yeah. yeah. That's what I really focused on and getting the covers right. So when did you find that that series started getting momentum? Was it straight from the get-go? Was it book two? Was it book three when they had, you know, books to follow through with? Um, right from the start, actually, they would, they did a lot better than my first series. They, I really um, found an audience with it that people love reading about witches. And so many of my readers were um is that I was talking positively about witches and witchcraft. And, of course, there's a lot of people who love Cornwall, so setting it in this lovely little kind of uh, fishing village in Cornwall is um, really good as well, and I love Cornwall, so that was great. Um, so book two then, yeah, it was received quite well. I put that up for pre-order, and I nailed that out really quickly as well. Um, and I actually did sit on the first one before I released it for a little while just so there wouldn't be a big gap between the second one and then yeah and and that was received really well so by the time book three came out I thought right I really want to start marketing it now yeah Uh, that was 2019 so I really started experimenting with Facebook ads at that point and what did you what was one of the biggest things you learned doing Facebook because Facebook ads are a very um they're a bit of a beast to tackle, especially initially yes. when you're very overwhelmed by what's happening and it can chew through your money like that. So yes. what was your biggest learning curve, I guess, in starting that? Um, just to, uh, yeah, just bid small yeah. for the small budget and um, try lots of images and don't give up and play around with your text and, uh, yeah, just to keep experimenting don't give up too soon I feel I was quite fortunate though in a way I just managed to get a lot of readers interested right from the start um but you know you have your ups and downs don't you with Facebook ads sometimes work really well and other times they just don't so what do you depend on now for your marketing what is the go-to's for you because I've noticed you also have Amazon ads too I do. So I actually, I've always run Amazon ads, just kind of run a few um, kind of low key ones. But um, last year, again, I started playing with those a little bit more, trying to make them work, um, really trying to get my impressions up. Um, But again, they can take so much time to do it, can't they really? So um, what I found was when I put Buried Magic free last year, that really gave my Amazon ads a bit of a boost. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm, I actually have more Amazon ads than anything running right now. Um, although I really would like to get a few more Facebook ads going again. That was something I was actually going to ask you. Um, speaking of, so you have that for free. You actually have a couple of the first books in numerous of your series for free. Um, yeah. And I think that for it can be such a great marketing technique for some people. Some people are willing to do it and others aren't. And that's just completely their decision. But it's obviously worked well for you. So I was curious as to how nervous you were about taking the plunge to make it for free and whether it was very quickly that you started noticing the results or whether you had to do a lot of marketing elsewhere for people to see it. Um, I was really nervous about it, actually, and I'd resisted it for a long time because obviously people do talk about it quite a lot, that it is, um, yeah, a really good thing to be doing, especially when you've got kind of five, six books, eight in a series. So um, I was resistant to um, because Buried Magic was earning me a lot of money as my first in series. But because there were hiccups kind of last year with the Facebook ads and they weren't performing as well, um, and I just thought maybe it's something worth trying. Plus, I'd gone wide with my books. You know, I'd taken them out of KU and I'd put them um, on all other platforms. And that's really important.
important to me that I'm on all of the platforms. And of course, a lot of people say the best way to kind of get traction is to put a first in series free. So yeah, I did it in December last year. And right away, I got lots of downloads and it yeah, just seemed to give the sales a bit of a boost. Mm-hmm. And it just means you don't have to fret quite so much about marketing. I mean, I still do it. If I didn't market, I wouldn't sell books, but um, or at least not as many. So I, I found it really useful. And yeah, I chose to do the same thing with um, my YA Arthurian series as well. Um, just because it just ticks along. It just ticks along. Because I noticed um, when I was having a cheeky little stalk that yeah. because of doing that, you are on like number four on one category under with the three categories, you're on, in the top 10, easy, which is amazing. Yeah, way. it is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's really important to choose your category as well, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yes, it, and I think it does help. Uh, I don't, I definitely far more actively promote my witches series than my other series um, because I found that it didn't matter really how much I pushed that. It didn't really affect the sales too much. So I'm quite happy for that to just tick along. Um, but, yeah, first in series has definitely made a difference for both. Yeah, that's amazing. I actually want to talk a little bit about your social media as well because you are yeah. – um, quite interactive and the same with your website as well what I love is that you have a blog where you talk about your travels and you also talk a lot about witchcraft as well and little did you knows basically and then I saw a post that I absolutely loved and I felt deeply was a post on your Facebook that said it wasn't witches that were burned back in the day it was women and basically explaining it and it was a post that you'd but it just really represented I felt in a way of sort of what one can expect by following you to connecting with you and I wondered what your take on social media was were you aware of sort of when you first got into writing how important social media was and keeping that engagement up with your readers yes I did know it was important but I was never on social media a lot to be quite honest um I never felt the need to kind of share my life every day on Facebook as some people are really comfortable doing. But I knew it was really important as an author to do it. So, uh, and then I found once I did set my Facebook author page up that I actually really kind of enjoyed it. It's a thing that you kind of have to learn to do. And I think some people are more comfortable with it than others. Now I'm feeling really comfortable with it. And of course, because I was running a lot of Facebook ads at one point, um, yeah, I've got a lot of followers on my page, you know, not as many as some, but yeah, enough that I get quite really good interaction and everybody's really interested yeah. in witchcraft things. So that tends to be what I kind of post quite a lot, as well as things about my books and audio books and obviously that kind of thing. Because you're, I think it's, is it over 13,000 followers you have on Facebook at the moment? No, not that many. I think it's about 14, 15, maybe more. I don't know. But yeah, so that was really good. So that was, that's a very positive thing to have come out of doing Facebook because people become aware of you. Yeah, absolutely. It's been very organic. So, you know, people have just kind of come along because Mm -hmm. they've kind of seen my books. Um, And then last year, probably about 18 months ago, I set up a, uh, in my Facebook group. Because everybody's saying that's the way to go as well. And I thought, um, and, you know, people like to kind of ask about various witchcraft things and talk about characters, and you can't do that on a Facebook page. So I set the group up and I polled my readers and said, hey, what, what names do you fancy? And I put a few names up there. I really like to involve my readers in the process. So uh, TJ's Inner Circle came out as the winner. So that's the name of my Facebook group. TJ's Inner Circle? Yeah. Excuse me while well, I just quickly go in. <laughs> <laughs> I will be a part of that group by the end of today. I love it. <laughs> awesome. So then speaking of process, um, I'd love to hear about your writing process and especially if you're getting your readers involved. I absolutely love that. What do yeah. you what do you do when you're writing? Do you have uh, is it very process? Do you like nine till five, I'm writing this day or yeah, and in that way I am process driven, yes. Um so my other half is obviously still at work. He gets me up 
every morning about half seven. So I get up and then by quarter past eight, I'm at the desk kind of going through emails and I usually listen to a bit of podcasting as well while I'm getting ready and uh, just getting rid of, uh, you know, just, um, yeah, dealing with, I guess, a bit of admin, I call it. And then usually by about nine, half nine, I kind of, I'm into the writing. So um, I always break for lunch and I do some exercises because otherwise I am literally just sitting at my desk all day. Um, And I aim to hit 2000 words every day. And I pretty much do um, sometimes more when I'm on a real roll, I can hit kind of 3000. But, um, and then I spend the other bit of the day as well doing a bit of marketing and a bit of catch up stuff or working on a few other bits and pieces. So yes, I have a very, a reasonably well-structured day. What's your writing process like? How do you articulate a story and write? Are you a pantser or a plotter? I am pantser all the way. Um, I cannot plot to save my life. It feels that I'm really constraining myself if I try and plot. I just can't. My brain won't wrap around it at all. So I have a vague idea of what the story is going to be about. Um, and I just literally roll with it and keep it reasonably character driven as well. Um, but obviously I like plots. I love mysteries. So yeah, I have to have, you know, a good plot and I weave lots of magic and obviously witchcraft and stuff in with it. But um, yeah, really it just rolls. I have no idea how a book's going to finish. That's amazing. I love. I think you and I write very similarly by the sounds of that. So I'm just really? like, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes you really, I don't know if you experience this as well, but I always uh, call it basically trying to figure out the puzzle. And there's some days where you just can't write because you're like, there is a piece missing here and I don't know what it is. And so I yeah. go about doing house business or whatever until it suddenly dawns on me and then straight back to the back cave. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm, I prowl around the house, sometimes talking to myself as I'm kind of talking stuff through or I just have to maybe lie down and enter. It's almost like this little bit of a dream state and just let my ideas kind of flit through. But um, I know if I'm going in the wrong direction because it's not flowing and I'm like, this is just not right at which point I have to stop bring it back and start again and I bet when you first started your writing career that you would continue writing through until the end of the chapter but now because you're a little bit more understanding of your art per se that as soon as you know it doesn't feel right you probably step away from it because you're like this doesn't feel right this yeah. isn't right. I'm not going to write the other words just to delete them again yeah just wait yeah I read somewhere that you are a massive Star Trek well I shouldn't say nerd but I mean I call myself a geek and a nerd as well so I I am yeah I accept that <laughs> it said with a demon so I'm curious yeah. if you ever plan on sort of writing a, a science fiction sort of something maybe similar to that I I doubt it actually um yeah I I do love Star Trek I'm an original fan I love the reboot they've done the originals um I'm like loving the spin-offs I just love it it's such a great world such great characters um such this big family feeling that they get but although I watch actually a lot of sci-fi as well I don't really read it so um I can't see myself ever writing any sci-fi as such so it's odd I, I watch it but I don't read it yeah so do you watch like a lot of fantasy and things like that as well or I certainly watch some fantasy. Yes, I do. Um, but I also love detective series and that kind of mystery stuff. So that actually tends to be a lot of my reading as well. Um, yeah. My, my other half is experimenting with a bit of sci-fi fiction at the moment. So he's doing a little bit on the side and some, yeah. So, um, but no, that won't ever be me. <laughs> So do you use um, write together silently in the same room like you use? Because I imagine it's very sort of, it'd be reflective a little bit for you watching him start out on his own book, knowing that you were there five years ago and being able to give him advice on things. That's a wonderful experience. Um, Yeah, he he just kind of has his own process that he kind of gets on with, but he's, yeah, a pantser as well, I would say, really, he doesn't plot. He has this big view like I have but that's that's about it but yet I do try and offer 
some advice. I don't know if he'll ever be serious about it, but we'll, but he's enjoying, he's enjoying himself with it at the moment. So that's cool. And I also yeah. saw that you have audio books, which I think is super cute. Uh, I was going to say cute. What I meant was super cool. Uh, <laughs> how did you go with that process? Um, I um, use Find A Way Voices because I was really keen on publishing again wide that it, my books would be available on all platforms. And again, just did a bit of reading about it first. It became very clear to me it was quite an important thing to do. You know that it was a growing market, but obviously it's also expensive. Um, but I just thought it was an investment, basically, to, to do it. So um, this year was going to be more my year of audio, but it's turned out a little bit slower than I'd anticipated, you know, just through various things. But, yeah, um, I'm, you know, auditioned my narrators through the Find A Way Voices process and um, have gone from there. So they make it really straightforward, to be quite honest, yeah. very straightforward. And it's, yeah, been an interesting thing to do. And how have you, how many audiobooks do you now have in the series? Um, so there's three out now. So Buried Magic came out. And Magic and Band last year. Um, Magic Unleashed has just come out. Hopefully, All Hallows Magic, which is book four, I'm hoping will be out maybe the end of next week. Oh. Um, yeah, so that would be really cool, just in time for Halloween. Um, and then my other series, because obviously I've written a spin off series from The Witches um, called Whitehaven Hunters. The first two books of those are in audio as well. Um, so I'm now just kind of rolling through them. And then the Tom series, um, the first book of that, before I re-edited it, was turned into an audio book, and I'm going to redo that next year. I've got my narrator lined up, but he's busy at the moment. And how have you found sort of the, and I'm asking all these questions because my focus next year is audio books, so I'm very oh, curious. Cool. Yeah, so I'm like, yes. more. And find a way, yeah. um, find a voice was also one of the options that I'm looking at. So I'm very yes. curious about it. How did you find initially when you released it? Did you have to do any extra marketing or did you let it sort of do its own thing? Because obviously it's an additive on the side if people enjoy books yeah. and they're going to see that as well if they want to go between. I haven't done any serious marketing of it, I'll be quite honest. I kind of just kind of put it out there. I've obviously promoted it to my uh, newsletter group and Facebook and put it on Instagram and a few other places. And lately I've been trying to work my way on TikTok and I've put a few bits up on there. But, um, but I did run an audio thicket a few months ago and that was definitely worth doing. So now I'm getting a few out in the series. I'm definitely going to look at doing more promotions of my audio. What's audio thicket? <laughs> um, it's done through, I think it's Bargain Booksy, you know, who... Um, oh, yes. Not Bargain Booksy, who is it? Their the, the thing. Free Booksy. I know who you're talking about because they do a couple yeah. of alternatives and they're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's through there. And, of course, because I published through Find Away Voices, I have access to Chirp. So I've been trying to get a chirp deal and they run through obviously the book bub deal. But um, so I've put a few up yet and haven't been accepted, but I'll keep trying on that. And the other thing I thought about doing for YouTube was I was listening to Lindsay Baroka's interview on Joanna Penn and she's put her first one up for free uh, and more, I think, now on YouTube. Yeah. And that would probably be a really good thing to try. So yeah. I'll be doing that soon. So I was actually, I had a very similar conversation with Lindsay um, because I did interview her earlier and we were discussing yeah. that actually and she has put majority of her books on there now. It was going very well for her and obviously when you reach a certain amount of subscribers on YouTube as well, you get monetized. So it made more sense for her receiving all of the royalties from that opposed to going on audio books or something else where they take a massive chunk mm. of it. And I know a lot of other people too, um, well, not a lot of other people, I've spoken to a couple of authors who use Patreon as well because and they're again receiving that full royalties but I think it is a great idea because people upload and plagiarize the audiobooks anyway it's very common that I'll go on and see yeah. um, very well-loved authors where their audiobooks on there that obviously isn't under their account somebody else is earning money yeah. from that so I think yeah. to some it might make sense to do that I think it's a good idea yeah. 
you've now had, I think it's like five, six audiobooks we're talking about now. Although audiobook is quite expensive, we're talking thousands of dollars. It's not mm. as you know, I find ebooks and paperback maybe slightly easier in pricing because you're used to that. Whereas some might think creating an audiobook is an extra expenditure. But as you said, it is an investment because it is a growing market. So yes. and you know, you've got five, six audiobooks now. So you've obviously found that it's it's working for you and it's just constantly growing as well. Yeah. And I mean I certainly don't um sell thousands of audiobooks a month by any means at the moment. It is it is slow. I think it takes quite a while to reap um your investment back. Um, for me anyway others might do a lot better but yes uh, but I'm hoping that the more that's out in the series the more read through I get and the, the more worthwhile it becomes but I do think it's a good thing to do. I had a, a author friend of mine she actually started audiobooks I think it was about two years ago but she said and this is real results everyone's different but she said it took her about a year to earn back what she had invested in creating it which yeah you know, if you're willing to put that investment down, I think that's the decision for a lot of people. If you're willing to put that investment down initially, you may not see results straight away, but you will eventually over time. And it's the same when you publish books as well, I suppose, just on yeah. a different platform. So it's each to their own. Yeah. yeah. And I and I think it's also, it's um, only something you should probably do if you've got the, you know, the money to do it. It's not with kind of putting all that money up front if you haven't got it. Just so that was something I did once I'd earned enough money off the ebooks to think it was worth investing in. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I want to yeah. talk a little bit because you're a bit of a traveler. So I want to talk yes. about what places have inspired you the most, especially for your writing. Um yeah, I do love traveling. Not a lot of that going on though, is there at the moment. But um I love kind of the exotic. Um so I loved going to India. I loved you know, going to Thailand. I love Bali. That's such an awesome place. But of course, although I love those places, it's not really reflected, I guess, in my writing yet. Um, potentially it will be, maybe with my spin-off series, I'm going to take my characters to a few different places. But, um, you know, there's some great places in England, obviously, and I love Cornwall. So that's really influenced the writing of obviously Buried Magic. Yeah. So... Um, so, yes, I'll probably be drawing on some travel stuff, maybe, you know, place I've been in the future. And if you want to, for those who are watching, if you want to hear about Tracy's travels, you can on a blog as well because she um, has uploaded. I think the last one you uploaded was Vietnam, was it? Yes, I think it was, which would have been a year or so. Yeah. No, uh, maybe two. Yeah, so I did talk a little bit about that there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not... Um, I probably don't blog as regularly as I should, but um, yeah, every now and again I try to pop stuff up there and talk about the background to my books and stuff and, yeah, share a little bit about where I've been. I'm like curious, have you done a lot of conventions and author signings? No, not at all. I did one here in Auckland oh, about a year or two ago, but um, it was at a, quite a small venue and to big one it just was not worth doing. Yeah. And we don't have like these really big events over here in um, in um, New Zealand. So, I mean, if I was elsewhere, I might consider it. But um, no, I haven't really bothered. Would you consider doing one like, say, um, traveling for like ones in Australia and stuff like that? Potentially, but I guess if you're getting on a plane, you know, you have to take your books with you. So you kind of got all this weight of the books and the stuff to set up your thing. So I, if I'm honest, I look at the trouble of it um, um, because it is quite an expense to do, um, especially if you're really not making any money back. So it's left me a little bit wary, actually, that one experience. Yeah. Have you done any? Oh, yeah, I love them. I live for them. Oh, do you? <laughs> I live for them. Um, I, I do quite enjoy um, doing international signings, but it is the reality is you don't necessarily make your money back every time because no. you are travelling. Um, but in saying that too, I use it as a bit of an excuse, you know, work and leisure, so I'll do a little bit of travelling yeah. myself. Um, sure. 
But it's the same thing. Some are a hit, some are a miss. It just depends on yeah. sort of the readership that's going as well. But I was yeah. going to say in regards to logistics for yourself, I don't know if you have like an Australian author friend, nudge, nudge, wink. <laughs> you can basically, if you print through Ingram Spark or whatever it may be, just organize with me. Um, and like <laughs> I could have your books and stuff like that. So you wouldn't have to do all that freight. They could just be. That in- is. That is an excellent idea. See, your readers are going to be loving me. They'll be like, yes, yes, force her to come. (laughs) Yeah, something definitely to think about. Um, Actually, where would you say that majority of your readership market is? Is there any one specific um, country or? Uh, The UK. The UK? Cornwall. Yeah. um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do definitely have some readers who live in Cornwall, but generally UK. and then probably yeah america is the second market after that but um, and then australia and canada what has been your most memorable reader interaction moment that's tricky i don't think there's any been any one particular one it's just that i do have some fab readers they're lovely they get in touch and we chat and um it's just lovely to be able to hear from people and what they enjoy. Um, I really enjoy posting polls in my in my Facebook group and in my inner circle and getting their feedback about characters and um, ideas of titles and things like that. So just that kind of thing. Um, yeah. It's recently what's happened is I've had um, a witch from a coven in the UK saying that they want to interview me about the fact that I write about witchcraft and and do it so knowledgeably, which has been really flattering to hear that I'm glad I've kind of done that justice. So that's been really cool. So I'll be doing that soon. Oh, that's exciting. And I'm assuming you'll yes. be uploading your links on the social media so we can watch it as well. I think they want to keep it private, to be quite honest. Oh. It's fair enough, you know. Um, Ask for but yeah, I am. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to doing it. Yeah, that'll be well. Congratulations, that's amazing. That's ah, awesome. thank you. Yeah, I love it's really it. Cool. For those who are watching, what would you say your top three marketing tips are? Oh, I think um, to in, just engage regularly with your readers. I think it's really important. Answer emails. Um, you know, respond to people who post on your social media, um, and to do to run ads. I think, um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't like running ads, you know, the pay-per-click model, but I do think it's just really important. There's so much competition. Um, and it is always, you're always trying to reach new readers. So, you know, advertising, I think it's really important. Um, what else? Three. Oh, I don't know if I've got a third. <laughs> I would have a newsletter list, of course. You've got to have... Um, you've got to have a newsletter list you know people you can contact directly I email every two weeks amazing petitions and giveaways and things like that amazing I think I've subscribed but I'm going to double check after this I need I need to be a part of that list (laughs) what would you say your greatest accomplishment and your greatest challenge has been so far in your writing career Um, I guess greatest accomplishment's been able to give up the day job 12 months ago and go full time I mean that was like fantastic it was so exciting and I'm I'm loving it so year in and I just love it I think a challenge is yeah just keeping the sales going um and I say finding new readers um and I guess I'm also thinking about another paranormal series uh again that I kind of hold my readers about you know what do they want to see from me next year um and so I'm thinking about, uh, yeah, another series that I might, that I want to write. I like that. What, yeah. I'm curious actually, how did you find your adjustment period from quitting your day job to then writing full time? Did you find that there was a odd adjustment period to sort of figure out what your process was like, or you just went straight into it nine to five, this is how it's going to be? Yeah, it was really easy, actually. And I th- I think it's because for about 18 months anyway, had it been that long, maybe a year, I'd actually dropped from five days a week to four days a week. So Thursday was my day off. And I had the structure that I now have in place on that Thursday. 
So it just rolled through to be an everyday thing. So it was, I got a little bit of a, I guess a program up for myself so before I'd left, like I'd mapped out, I want to have this print, you know, published by then. Uh, and I just rolled straight into it. I have a segment called Speed Dating author you and I are going to go on a very <laughs> romantic date I lit a candle okay. and created ambience um so basically what it is is five rapid questions are you ready no. I, I think so yes <laughs> what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had clumsiest moment um I do a lot of gardening and I was wheeling my wheelbarrow up a my wheelbarrow up a makeshift um ramp which collapsed and I ended up headbutting <laughs> the wheelbarrow and uh, giving myself black eyes and a nosebleed. So that was quite a spectacular crazy moment. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but that's kind of funny. It was. I've been so sore though. Yeah, and I just went headlong into it because, of course, I was going up this little ramp to kind of move rocks. I'd been digging out a new bed, so I'd got speed up as everything. So, I, yeah. That was really quite spectacular. Yeah. Oh, that's an epic fail. I love that. What yeah. are the three words that would best describe you? Um, stubborn would be one. Calm, I think, would be another. Um, uh, easygoing. It's not really one word, but, yeah, I'm pretty easygoing, pretty cruisy. What's your life motto? Um, never give up. You've just got to keep trugging along. What's the song that best describes you? Uh, I haven't got a song, you know, that would best describe me. I never really think of music, I guess, in that way. I love music. I love listening to music and I've got kind of lots of different things that I like. But, yeah, I haven't got a song that would best describe me. Is there any particular artist or band? You, who is your favourite, should I say? Who's your favourite artist or band? Um, also, I guess kind of tricky. I mean, back in the 90s, I was a grunge girl. So I had kind of pink hair and wore, you know, ripped tights and I had big boots <laughs> and I was a massive fan and still am, you know, of Pearl Jam, Sam Garden, all those really cool, um, Mud Honey, all those things. So obviously big soft spot for those I love an 80s girl as well, so I love my Duran Duran. But I love blues. I love blues and jazz. So really that, think, don't you? I'm not a big pop fan. Yeah, <laughs> big pop fan. Rock yeah. is where it's at more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love rock, so I'm completely okay with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your unique talent or skill set that a lot of people don't know of? Mm, unique well, we used to... Um, we haven't done it for a while, but we used to make little short films for the 48 Hour Film Festival. I've heard there's a few of us. So I used to act as producer. So I guess that's a little hidden skill. I'm kind of good at big picture stuff and being organised. Um, yeah, so you could call that one maybe. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever thought about doing creating your own book trailer or something like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not the editor, though, or, or the person who films. That would be my other half. So it's definitely been on the agenda of something I should probably look at doing. I'm so excited for that. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I've had so much fun, Tracy. Where, where do we find you? Where do we stalk you? And what's coming out next? Okay, so obviously I have a website, tjgreen.nz. Um, I'm on Facebook. TJ Green author. I'm on TikTok, TJ Green author. Not a fat lot on TikTok so far. I'm muddling my way through. Oh, you're doing good though. I had a little, I can't, I'm stalking you everywhere. <laughs> let's be real. But that's, that's cool. cool. <laughs> you're doing awesome. Oh, yeah. I should um, post more frequently. I think that's the trick. Really. That, is, that is the key. I'm pretty that's bad at it. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, in other days I'm like, um, um, but yeah, Instagram. So I'm on all of the usual places. Um, what else? Oh, my inner my inner circle, obviously. TJ's inner circle, and you can sign up for my uh, newsletter. Um, but yeah, next on the agenda. So I'm just about to finish the White Haven, which is your Tide novella. So that will be out in December. 
Dark Star, which is the Whitehaven Hunters book three, is with my editor now, that's it in November. Then right after that, I'll be rolling on to the ninth Whitehaven Witches book. So next year, I'm looking at putting out two Whitehaven Witches, two Whitehaven Hunters, and hopefully somewhere in the middle of that, I'm going to be looking at my new paranormal mystery or maybe a, maybe a Tom novella, you know, my Rise of the King series. I might put some out there. So, yeah. That's so exciting. I look forward to seeing those and I'll be sharing and I'll be uh, celebrating with you from afar, but not too far. Aussie and New Zealand. Cool. <laughs> <together>. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. I have had so much fun today. Thank you so much for joining me, Tracy. So have I. Thank you for asking me. It's been really nice to be um, asked to be interviewed. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows, next year I might uh, see if you can pop back on again. Watch your space. Cool. All right. Thank you. That's all right. I'll talk to you later, Tracy. Bye.